Hello, my friends. Welcome to another episode of Deep True Crime. I'm Manny Rodriguez. Thank you for joining me today. In today's video, we have a very special guest on who we are going to be interviewing, and we're going to learn a little about life how we go through different phases, those ups and downs, and truly have something special come out at the end. This gentleman is a huge victim's advocate. He's got a lot of stories on his plate right now that he is working with, and he's truly someone who has overcome adversity. And I'm so excited to have this true crime author, someone who is always in the news, someone who is always giving to victims and helping every single way they can. My friends, I want you to meet William Steele, true crime author, someone who is making a lot of noise and I highly recommend you get to know him. William, thank you so much for joining. Hey, do you go by William? Is that right? I want to make sure I'm right on that. You can call me William. How you doing, man? Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. You know, if it's one thing I'm a big fan of is, you know, who can we help to stay a little more safer in their world? And that's why I love what you do. If you can share a little of, of who you are, where you come from, share your story a little bit before I start asking you those, those quick questions that you don't even know that are coming your way. Share a little if you don't mind. Well, I, I grew up in, uh, in New York City in Brooklyn, um, a middle class family. Uh, my mother was mentally ill. She was a lot of bullying and stuff going on there. And I learned to defend the underdog at an early age. Um, eventually, I went into real estate. I also went to locksmith school and I became uh, kind of perverted those skills uh, in the middle of a cocaine addiction years ago. And I started becoming a jewel and art thief. So I went all around the country. I did a whole bunch of uh, illegal things. Um, and I just ended up doing time. I got caught, uh, a few, you know, more than once, um, while I was incarcerated, I escaped from prison. So I did over 18 years on nonviolent crimes and stole millions of dollars all over the country. And while incarcerated, I took some college courses and I started writing books, um, not only about my life, but about my faith journey, because my faith is the most important thing to me now, but also about some of the characters I've met along the way. Uh, for example, Robert Durst, Ghislaine Maxwell, and there's other ones coming up, people I've met out in California, New York. Uh, I spent a lot of time in South Florida, Palm Beach, Boca Raton, Fort Lauderdale, uh, Las Vegas. So now, when I was getting out of prison, one of my books was already out. I was about to put the, the Ghislaine Maxwell book out, and uh, I was offered a TV show. So now, we just filmed 10 episodes. It's going to air on a major network this summer. And it's really about my life and rejoining society and about my books. And I am not allowed by my contract to discuss exactly what network, but it's an extremely huge network. Um, they do a lot of true crimes uh, programming. But uh, so it's going to be on there and in, uh, in August. So August 2022. And so I'm still writing books. And now I, victim, I work for victim advocacy. Um, helping victims of crime also help the victims of wrongful conviction, people that have been wrongfully convicted. I work with that with my fiance, Dr. Mary Bass. Uh, she's a, a real crime fighter. She's been a zealous advocate for uh, the victims of crime, uh, having two uh, murder victims in her family and uh, a big racketeering uh, inheritance fraud scheme that she uncovered in Fresno, California. And she's been heavily retaliated on for that. So that's kind of what brings us to today. Starting a podcast, YouTube channel is up. I've been doing a lot of interviews and getting ready for this uh, TV show to air. And I go out of my way to try to change the things from my past to help people and to use my experience to do that. Um, in the beginning of my books, there's a quote that I put in every book and it's uh, from Edmund Burke and it's, uh, it's all that's needed for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. So, you know, you're that good man. You're putting these stories out there, showing, a, you know, a, another side of things and what people can do to make a difference in their lives and change not only their ways, but to protect themselves from, you know, the person that I used to be. You know, uh, if you were ex extremely wealthy, you're extremely affluent, you know, I, w I was coming and I had ways to go about it 
that you would never see it coming. And, you know, God and cocaine addiction, of course, interfered. So in, in the midst of doing all these crimes, we were also moving kilos of cocaine and guns from South Florida to New York for a very long time throughout the 80s and early 90s. Bottom line, many years in prison, college courses, my faith, a lot of loss while I was in prison, my mother passing away, uh, family members, you know, uh, stealing from me while I was incarcerated. It really cost me to see the light and, and just want to go back to being that good guy again, where I can turn it around and help people. And I'm glad to do it. Nice. Number one, thank you for your courage. Thank you for number one, being vulnerable and sharing who you were and who you are now, because truth is we love a comeback story, right? We're, we're ones that, Hey, we understand we're human. We're going to do things in our life that we probably shouldn't be doing. And I, and, but what, what comes out of that? Something very positive has come out of this, William. Great, great job. I commend you for everything that you're doing now and the story that you're sharing. And with that being said, you know, that's what we're about. We want to help people stay safer. What, what, what are some red flags that we can be looking for in the case of, say, someone who, if we are of affluent nature, what should we be careful of? Like, how are some ways they get to us? Now, I'm not saying that's me, but if that was me, because you said that's the person you, you were after, how can that person be a little more protected now? Well, I, in, in my upcoming book, there's going to be a list of actually tips about burglary and crime for prevention tips. But it could be something as simple as, i give you an example. It's, you guys are going to think it's funny, but cats, cats, if somebody's creeping around your house, a cat will know before most dogs will. If they're on your windowsill hissing at something, you better go figure out what's out there. Obviously, security cameras, since I was incarcerated, they've exploded. They're everywhere get cameras, have them activated all the time, um, have them recording remotely so that you have the footage, put good signage up that you have them so you're not just catching people after you're robbed or dead, but you're deterring them before the fact. Another good thing, obviously, at nighttime, motion sensors, you know, in your backyard that pop on floodlights. No one likes noise or floodlights when they're doing a crime. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've gone through a, a yard or just went around a house and a floodlight or a sign was up and I said, you know what, let me let me go somewhere else years ago. And now with the cameras everywhere, you know, make sure the motion activation gets everything. Simple things like putting gravel underneath your windows, because if you have a pet or an animal that's gonna hear things outside, gravel is something that makes a lot of noise. And I'll tell you what, a burglar hates walking on gravel and most animals will hear that. Then there's a type of plant, I can't remember the name of it now, it looks sort of like an aloe, and it's got pointy little purple spikes on it. And uh, South Florida had a lot of those, but you point, you plant those around, you know, the base of windows and stuff. So people don't, are not gonna wanna mess around and, you know, get, get cut up. So there's a lot of little uh, tips that you can do. I also used to take, for example, even a fake Rolex or a, a money clip with maybe a hundred dollar bill on a stack of uh, singles and leave it right on my dresser. And then I would have a safe with basically nothing in it, a small little cheap safe that are useless and just have that visible in the closet or something. So if somebody broke in my house, they'd steal a money clip with some singles on it, a fake watch, and, and a, uh, you know, a safe with nothing in it, you know, or maybe you put, a, you know, put something in there to, like as a prank, like, hey, would you like a soda or something, you know. But so you give them something to take and leave if they do get in. And then you have your valuables, the best place to keep those is probably gonna be in a square floor safe, a burglar resistant safe, not a fire resistant safe, and those are good place for those is like mounted in a larger room um, into the ground with a tile or a carpet over it, maybe some dirty laundry, the hamper. So when nobody's around, no visitors, and you need your jewelry or whatever your valuables are, your cash, you go in the laundry room and get it. Nobody knows the thing is there. Don't keep the safe in your living room. Don't keep the safe in your home office. Don't keep it in your bedroom because they will get they will tear them out. They will bring tools in there to cut and get them open. And in my case, if I had time, I can manipulate most safes open. So these are some practical tips you can take. Um, also be careful who you let in your house, make sure they're aware that they're on video. 
Um, if it's something like an open house or something with filters, make sure they're signing a log or presenting an ID. It seems a little bit much, but you know, there was a time when I posed as Donna Karen's brother and I was looking for a house to buy. And we were looking for three to $6 million house. And I had realtors all over the country take me in the house thinking that my sister was Donna Karen, a fashion designer, that she was doing a fashion show. And I would be able to case these houses, walk out with a brochure, glossy floor plans, everything, the schedule, because the realtor will tell you everything about the person's schedule. Um, you know, have a sit down with your realtor, let them know that not to discuss schedule. Let them think that there's a housekeeper or a groundskeeper coming over or living at the house. There's, these are many different ways you can, you can, you can uh, discourage uh, yourself from becoming a victim and discourage uh, a, a burglar, a run-of-the-mill burglar and a professional burglar. Um, dogs help, obviously, attack dogs and all that. But these simple common sense things like leave bait for them if they do get in to just take and leave. Because chances are pretty good they're not going to look through your laundry room for your real safe and your real valuables if they get a money clip with 100 bucks in it and, and, and a safe that's locked, but it's it's a nothing safe that would look like it was hiding in your closet. They'll run out with the safe and break into it somewhere else and get nothing. So these are little throw off things. You wow. Can do. Like that was phenomenal on what you were sharing there. And here's the thing. I didn't tell you I would be asking this question right away. You were just like on it. Like, okay. Oh yeah. Do this, do this. I like that's someone who has thought this through on both ends, right? That's what uh, right. I would say. That's one of the things you do as a victim's advocate. Protect, protect yourself. Be careful. Here are some red signs, some red flags. Is that fair to say? Right. I just try to educate yourself. I'm sure there's plenty of sites up on the Internet that show you some tips. I know that with the explosion of social media, many celebrities and other people have been victimized by publicizing their whereabouts, their vacations, their travel. I think uh, it even happened to Kim Kardashian. So, but uh, this is what people look for, you know, post your vacation photos after the vacation. I think uh, they're doing some lawn work outside here. I apologize for the background noise. That, that'll definitely happen. I almost lost you there for a second, but I see your eyes moving now. <laughs> so how else do you help? Yeah, they're, they're, I know that you, <laughs> sorry. No, I was saying, I think they're doing some lawn work right outside my window. I apologize for that. Gotcha. I hadn't heard it, but I don't have my, my audio too loud. If you can share, because I know that you do even more as a victim's advocate. What are some of the things that you do as a victim's advocate for people? I know that you mentioned there were a few cases that you're working on. Right. Because of my platform and the upcoming TV show, my social media has been growing. And I ask people to please go. The William Steele author on my YouTube channel, subscribe and share and subscribe. Also my Instagram, I have almost 11,000 followers already. We expect way more. So I'm getting a good platform and a lot of exposure. So what I'm trying to do is learn how to be sensitive to the needs of crime victims, but also I'm finding cases on the internet, um, for example, where somebody's had a loved one murdered and they're not getting justice. The Larry, uh, the, the murder of Larry, uh, Larry Revis in Fresno, California is one Larry example. We're trying to get some more information on that. Um, also, Trina McCreary, um, the boyfriend brags, you know, that he murdered her. And he's not been arrested. Um, and this is in Elkhart, Indiana. So Trina McCreary. Then we have uh, the murder of Alex Blake Van Delsen. He uh, was murdered. They're claiming it was a suicide, but everything points to murder. And there's not much being done about it. And then you also have the Delphi murders of the two young girls in Indiana. Um, there was another one that was uh, trying to check my notes here real quick to make sure I covered on the ones we're getting ready to interview on my own show. So the uh, the case of uh, Paula Turkovic, her mother has a great site um, trying to find out what happened to her daughter. It turns out that she was evidently raped and murdered. Police aren't doing much about it. Every time she tries to post something about it on the internet, uh, somebody's hacking and taking it down. So what I'd like to do is bring awareness to those cases by posting them on my social media and interviewing them for my podcast and telling people like you about them. So maybe you could interview them as well. And we're trying to give them a, 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 a 
basis to be heard. Um, also on the cases of the wrong, wrongfully convicted, we have Dave Reinhardt. If you can go to DaveReinhardt.com, wrongfully convicted in California. He's in prison there now. The case of Dr. Leslie Marlon Scholl. Dr. Scholl was set up by a corrupt informant, federal informant, after he stole, after the informant stole over a million dollars from him and the doctor wanted his money back. It was a fake real estate scam. And the guy entrapped him on some fake gun transfer thing and had him locked up for 13 years. Well, Dr. Soul just got released and we're trying to help him get his medical license restored. And I know he's working with some New York attorneys to try to uh, get this final conviction uh, removed from his record. Because now the informant, Charles Ray Smith, is himself facing 120 years and then just committed perjury by lying to the federal judge uh, back in uh, October at his very first hearing. So these are some of the cases that we're working on. Wow. And so that's where now who you are today, is it because of kind of what you went through as that other side? Well, on the other side, you know, I did a lot of things I'm not proud of. And uh, again, you know, I'm not the person I was. And I think uh, I've been out just over a year now from over 18 years. And things are starting to look up. I'm back to myself again. There's no, there's no substances involved in my life. There's no desire to lose anything else, break the law, or hurt anybody else. So I just have always had a heart for people because of my mother's mental illness and the things I grew up seeing her go through. I always tried to help the underdog. But now, when I was in prison, I was a law clerk. I was on the um, offender representative committee working with the administration and the offenders to try to come to terms with different issues, whether the medical denial of medical care or rights that they were being denied and try to work things out to avoid litigation. So I've always had this heart to help people. And now with social media, it didn't even exist when I went to prison. I think this is the perfect platform to do it in a big way and try to help everybody that I can. We're trying to make it to the uh, Lane Maxwell uh, sentencing uh, in New York. And I'm in the Midwest right now filming my TV show, but we're trying to get back to New York to uh, do some uh, book signings and attend possibly the Ghislaine Maxwell sentencing. I knew her years ago. Um, you know, my book is all about her. You have, a, you have the information about my book. It's available on Amazon. It's called Ghislaine Sensational and Impure. Um, and your viewers are more than welcome to uh, buy a copy. I appreciate your support. Yeah, and with that being said, we do have all of, your, of, all of William Steele's information in the chat. So you should definitely check out the Ghislaine Maxwell story. I did a little piece on it, nothing in the same realm as you have because you were right up close with these individuals. And, you know, so that's why I appreciate exactly what it is that you're doing and what you're doing moving forward. Because here's the truth. We need more mouthpieces. We need more people to help raise awareness this is what could go wrong in our life if we're not a little more careful with our life and that's why i love the a lot of the tips that you shared with what can people do with being a little more careful and so share this here now i you sent this over and i had a chance to read it but can you can you expand a little on your relationship with Robert Durst, Robert Durst. Right. Back in the 80s, I met uh, Robert Durst in Manhattan, right? When I, at the time, I was attending the locksmith school down midtown Manhattan. I met him. I met Susan Berman. She kind of slipped up and said something about, you know, he's paranoid because his wife was just murdered. He's uptight. And then she corrected herself. She's like a Freudian slip and said, I meant she's missing. Right then, I knew something was wrong. Street smarts kicked in. I said, he killed his wife, she's covering for him. And this was in the 80s. He and I stayed in touch because I was trying to get information out of him and money out of him at the time. And so you have to read the book. Um, if you have the book cover there, I think the display, but it's called Sex and the Serial Killer, My Bizarre Times with Robert Durst. And it shows you my interactions with him over the years and trying to gather this information for authorities. And um, all along, he was paying me for the use of my place in Brooklyn. Um, so that's how I knew him. I actually went to the trial. He went on trial for murdering uh, mafia princess Susan Berman in, uh, in 2000. He went on trial for that in Los, Los Angeles. 
um, last year, a few months ago. So last June, I was actually at the trial. Um, we're going to be doing some stories about that, what happened. Um, so I knew I, I knew, knew him, and I was had information that was helpful to the authority, authorities regarding him and some of his murders. And uh, you know, he killed his first wife, Kathy Durst. And so I talked to some of the family members, and they're still very, very bitter that Westchester County, New York, has never bothered to prosecute him. One prosecutor after the other, uh, just you know, because the family's worth billions of dollars, they just ignore what a serial killer's doing. And I'm not going to say much more than that without putting a target on my back. But uh, one prosecutor after the other did nothing about it. And the last one, finally, I guess she had him indicted before a grand jury. And then he died a few months later of COVID in jail or prison in, in uh, California, which is just a few months ago. So these poor people have had no justice for 40 years. And it's just disgraceful. But a lot more is going to come out about that as well, because... Uh, there's a lot of cover up and enabling by uh, his wife and by the Durst family and his brother Douglas. So a lot more is about to come out with that. Wow. So you're still kind of staying on top of the whole thing with the family. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, Mary's a forensic, uh, a forensic uh, accountant and fraud examiner, and she's done a lot of uh, history into finances and financial crimes uh, regarding a lot of these people. And she was able to discover like inappropriate movement of funds out to California. Um, I'm not going to say by who exactly, right when the trial was going on and read between the lines. So we're getting ready of uh, that and some other illegal things that uh, Ghislaine Maxwell was involved with. She's dug into that and we're going to present that to the U.S. Attorney's Office in New York, hopefully before the sentencing. Wow, wow, wow. So that is so awesome. So now your your opinion, whatever you can share on Ghislaine Maxwell, do you think that we've heard the end of the whole thing or is there going to still be more stuff that keeps coming out? I think they're going to, uh, she's going to cut a deal at the very end. She held out to the bitter end. I think uh, the time she wanted Jeffrey Epstein dead, uh, she said she wanted that done because Jeffrey Epstein is going to be the death of her. Well, he's dead now. But she has dirt and videos galore on so many other people that she can make a deal, witness protection, that let her live in New Zealand or somewhere. But wherever she decides to live, she's highly identifiable. I don't think she'll survive. I think she'll cooperate. She'll get out. It'll take a year or two. Somebody, unfortunately, will probably kill her. Wow. She, so she, she's got stuff. Some of the things I saw at the Palm Beach house, I, I can't even go into them here without getting you deplatformed from YouTube. <laughs> so that's, uh, yes, it's that's in my so, book. I'm not trying to mess up my relationship with YouTube. I'm just starting to get this momentum going. <laughs> and I'm just, and I'm just starting to learn about the risk of deplatforming. If you say certain things about super powerful people who are not necessarily convicted, a lot of it's in my book. If you guys are interested, please buy the book. It's supporting me post incarceration by putting the story out. I was probably the only insider right now who's actually written a book about her. So that's the uh, the other book would be the Ghislaine Sensational and, and Impure. It's right behind me here. Gotcha. There you go. That's it. Go to my website, WilliamSteelAuthor.com or on Amazon, Ghislaine Sensational and Impure. And you'll find stuff in there that has never been put out before. And I risked my life by putting it out a few months ago. But it's there now. Part two is coming out after the sentence. So they can order your books at the at your website as well, or should they through it? Like they could just scan this this code. Right, they can scan that code and take you there. You can order either one of the books, and uh, I'm really grateful for that. Uh, I really, I'm trying to really pick up subscribers on my YouTube channel. Also, William Steele, author on YouTube. It's a true crime channel. You can Google me with Prince Andrew. My name pops up in steel. Google me with Ghislaine Maxwell. My name will pop up. New York Post. I'm in the New York Post. I'm in the National Enquirer. I'm in the Sun from London. The Independent um, was about to interview me. Daily Mail TV has interviewed me. And then the war in Ukraine broke out. And so they're holding the piece back. Uh, I don't know when they're going to air it. 
but they did about a two hour interview. They came flew out here a few weeks ago. They interviewed me and that's going to air, I think right around the sentencing. They, they were going to air it a few weeks ago, but then the, the Ukraine situation broke out. Nice. So you're literally staying busy all the time in New York. It sounds like are you, you're not in New York at the very moment though. You're working on your I'm, show. I'm, that's right. I'm in the Midwest. Uh, we found episodes in Elkhart, Indiana, which is the RV capital of the United States. Very nice familiar. place until we ran into a prolific con artist. Yep. If you, if you look up Charles Ray Smith, Elkhart, pro prolific con artist. He posed to me, he was a federal informant, but he posed to me as a high ranking Hells Angel. He's got a big mansion on the river here. What's um, the name? You know, millions of dollars in assets, gold bar. Charles Ray Smith, Elkhart, Indiana. And if the FBI finally locked this guy up, he's been conning people for decades. Um, he brags with the help of the local police. I don't see any evidence of that. That's what he claims, that he's friends with detectives. And I'm certain he's naming them all now to the FBI because that's all he does is, you know, uh, inform and make up stuff on other people. So I'm sure he's trying to get out of his own mess now by doing that. Um, which is fine if his information is legitimate, cooperate with authorities by all means. But there's proof coming out now that he has put many people in prison that have been innocent. Wow. That yeah. is... Charles Rich. Wow. He he set up Dr. Leslie Marlin Scholl. Uh, we, are, we are doing a crowdfunding for him and trying to help him, but the lawyers have said to refrain for the time being until they put their case together. I don't know. I'm not in the middle of the legal wranglings. I just want to see the man rebuild his life. He got released in December and he's really struggling. His own family and children don't talk to him anymore because they thought the murder for hire stuff was true, but that was dropped in 2009, but they still kept him in prison for 13 more years over some bogus firearms transfer to this guy, Charles Ray Smith. There was supposed to be some paperwork done that wasn't done. So they gave him 13 years stripped him of two medical clinics. His wife got about $7 million. He lost about a million dollars to Charles Ray Smith. And Charles Ray Smith goes about his business bragging that he killed his girlfriend because she gave a cell phone to the FBI that helped make the current case against him. Wow. He's, he's bragged to many people. He, sent me, he has sent me pictures of her dead uh, on the kitchen floor. He has sent me pictures of dead bodies everywhere bragging that he's a hitman. He has bragged to me that he was retained by a celebrity in California to kill Brad Pitt. I mean, this guy is all over the map. I don't know what's true and what's not, but these are the things he said. These are things that the authorities and the people around him know, know that he has said. Wow. So what book is up next then with all these stories you got going on? Is one of them leading to your next book? I don't know if I could, if you're going to give anything away, but... I have one that's uh, the working title is the William parts, you know, the parts of my life, uh, sort of like life story, which is what this was going to be to begin with. My co-author, Gary Greenberg, who wrote the beer diet book, great book. He was the editor in chief of the national Enquirer, And as Durst became in the news and, and some of the famous people that I knew became infamous, you know, we discussed possibly writing these smaller books about them where really they were just going to be a chapter in my book about my life story. So that's why these books came out first. But the book about my life is coming out, you know, a lot more detail. And I uh, don't have a title for it just yet. But then there's another one about my faith journey and what that's meant to me as far as turning my life around. And uh, like, for example, when you do time, there's various prison ministries that come in. One that comes to mind is Kairos. And then these college courses, I was fighting to get them approved for years and they finally got approved. So uh, I was in Virginia doing time and Washington Lee University came in. And all these things have made a tremendous difference in my life and attitude. You have to understand, prison administrators, for the most part, benefit nothing for somebody to turn their life around. You know, it shoots them, them in the foot because recidivism, me coming back to prison, is job security for them. So there's not a lot going on trying to get college courses and people to really change. They want to just, you know, ignore the, a lot of the dope coming in and let the gang members all kill each other and turns out all the gang leaders are usually the ones telling on each other. They're the ones working closest with the feds, working closest with the prison investigators. 
and then they're they're signing up these underlings to work for them and do their dirty work while they're meeting with the investigators every time you turn around. So it's a dirty game all the way around. No one wins, and all you do is destroy people and destroy yourself in the process. And I finally came to this realization that all the loss I sustained and all the hurt I've endured and subjected my family and my kids to because of my absence, none of it was worth it in the end. I can never get those years back. I can never restore those relationships to what they should be now. And so the days of darkness has caused me to see the light, so to speak. And that's that's where I'm at. Those college courses meant a great deal to me. Ministries made a great deal to me coming into the prisons. Uh, I got involved volunteering with the chaplain's office, helping with these ministries. Now people can say plenty of guys get out and they start saying they, you know, they saw the light and, you know, thank you, Jesus. But it really becomes watch the person's track record over time. You know, nobody's perfect. Plenty of people can screw up again and again, whether or not you're claiming faith or you're claiming, you know, a higher power, whatever you're claiming, you have to make a personal decision that enough is enough is enough. And I've come to that conclusion several years ago in prison. Enough is enough. I don't want to ever go back. I don't want to ever hurt anybody again. And William, thank you so much for sharing. Like, again, and here's one thing you said. It originally was about to start off with a book with stories in it. And I can already tell in our little time in this interview, you have a lot of stories to share. And I can tell you actually like talking about it. And that's a good thing because that keeps you going every day, willing to do it, right? To do it because you're passionate about what you're doing. I can feel right, but, it but every let, time you talk. But let me be real clear, Manny, this truly is not about glorifying my past, but making the change necessary to try to never go back and to try to help people in the process. I don't want to glorify what I've been through, but if my stories can help people solve a crime, solve a murder, uh, uh, keep a kid out of prison or keep a kid from trying drugs, I'm going to get up there and talk about it. Um, I look forward to go speaking to churches and youth groups and, you know, uh, prosecutors, prosecutors groups. I volunteer to speak for law enforcement, to, to the prosecutors, to the FBI. Anybody who'll have me, I'll be glad to share my stories to try to open their eyes, maybe educate them from the other side. This is truly not to glorify the things I've done, but I'm just on this journey of life, man. I'm trying to make these changes and make things right somehow, some way. I thank you for sharing. And truth is, when you know what led you down that, ro that road the first time, and you know, let me not take that road this time, that keeps you going on your right path. And I've learned that myself. It's like, okay, what got you into these problems? Okay, remember how that felt? You know, and it's like, don't do it again by not getting into that same situation. Great. And you just literally you said the same thing. I'll tell you what, you said you were from New York, so I'm assuming we're roughly the same age. You look a little younger. But Bronx, remember Curtis Sliwa, founder of the Guardian Angels? Yes, yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. I was a Guardian Angel when I was about 15 years old. I was on the right track at one point. I was one of the original, not, not I can't say it was the original with, with Curtis, but I knew him and his wife at the time, Lisa, very, very well. And now look at how far he's come where he's run for mayor of New York. And here I was in prison saying, wow, this guy, some people think he might be a little bit arrogant, but all his life he's done nothing but the right thing and try to protect people. And that's what we got involved with if, as young teenagers. We were patrolling subway trains, trying to you know, prevent people from getting hurt. Oh, I subways. remember. And how the hell my life got so derailed was mostly because I started with that damn cocaine and I regret it to this day, I wish I never touched it. I don't drink, I never smoke weed, don't do any of that. I tried cocaine and it was all, it was all over for me. So I, I tell everybody- A big learning lesson, do not try that stuff because you're gonna go down the wrong path. It, it's that, it, as someone who, my family was so much into drugs, my mom would later die of AIDS, you know? So it's like, that's a very scary thing and Thank you for sharing that because Sorry. that's what leads down. It's like, before you know it, you're on a mission to get that. Everything, nothing else matters but getting that. My mom said that to me. I was on a mission. And, you know, she literally, AIDS took her life. So thank you. This is what it's I mean. This thing. is why your story matters. 
to help other people. And that's why I'm going to have to share one more time, like my friends, like look what he is doing. He's doing his best to number one, stay on his right track while he helps you stay on your right track. And I love what you've done as you've continued to grow, especially with these books. I mean, great job with what you're doing because let's be real. Both of these guys are big names in online right now like robert durst oh my gosh especially if you're from new york right his whole family owned real estate out there they were like the the, the they were like the donald trump basically <laughs> they still they still manage the world trade center complex and probably 20 or 30 percent of new york city real estate they're still worth billions of dollars and and they won't simply settle with the victims families they want this to blow up in the media again and again and again why i don't know they I have to be careful what I say, but there's allegations that they've repeatedly enabled and concealed his crimes, including the murder of Kathy Durst, his first wife. And it's just it's just disgraceful what they're allowing the, the family members of the victims to go through in Kathy's family. Wow. I, and and that's where she's now what she's the she's someone that you're fighting for. She's uh, the focus of my first book, really, Sex and the Serial Killer, is really focused on her raising awareness that he's never been convicted of uh, her her uh, murder. She, like I said, he was indicted a few months ago, but that was after he was convicted in Los Angeles, finally, of killing Susan Berman, and then he died of COVID right after they sent him to prison. So, you know, there's, there's no justice for the family 40 years later, and many other victims. There's a, a college student. In, uh, in Vermont and there's other victims around the country. So he was a very wealthy, probably worth $100 million at the time of his death, uh, serial killer. He was a sexual sadist serial killer. Wow. He killed witnesses and victims, uh, people that were gonna be witnesses against him, like Susan and, and his wife even, but he's also uh, was a sexual sadist uh, killer. So, you know, if you read the book, you'll see some of the stuff I wrote about and stuff he brought around my house in New York and. Um, here's the thing. I'm not the only one that knows these things. I'm the only one crazy enough to come forward and talk about it. Okay. I've had a certain agency try to shut me down, uh, by it's in the book by reading me my Miranda rights over the Susan Berman murder. And I said, wait a minute, I have somebody else have you come out here. And the only way they would come out is because somebody from the Durst organization asked them to see me, but then they tried to shut me down by intimidating me. And I said, well, why would you suspect I did it when I was in jail in Miami at the time of her murder? So this is a reason why we decided to write books. Can you see me still? Yeah, I think you might be getting a call in or something. Yeah, I don't know how to cancel that. Uh, All right, we'll give it just a second. Man, like you're literally sharing so much great information. And I can tell, like, I look forward to that next book. Like, all right, now what's he going to come up with next? Because he's truly enjoy. Like, he, you have so much information. And I can tell, like, you know, let me be careful what I say here because that could, you don't want anyone, you know, you don't want to get yourself in trouble, but you want to spread the truth the best you can. And you're doing well, a great well, I'm job. Not, not, I'm not worried about any troubles as far as charges. That, you know, everything's many, many years ago, and I did nothing that I could still be charged with. There's no violence, there's no murders on my part. What people are concerned about, about coming forward now, is these people you're coming forward against are very powerful. They can have people killed and certain people have turned up dead. They can sue you out of existence, you know, to try to cover up, you know, what, what I know, what other people know. So these are the concerns anybody coming forward has right now. So I'm thinking that my spotlight, you only have very few people coming forward. And some of the victims of uh, Maxwell and Epstein uh, to me, are inspiration for me that they came forward. You know, some of the female victims. Yes. Well said there. Well said. My friend, thank you so much for jumping on with us today and doing this interview and sharing such great information. And thank you for sharing your faith because that's where it really, that's where it's like when God changes your heart, you're ready to be changed. Like it doesn't happen till then. Otherwise, it, this is part of the journey. This is your story. This is what's going to help you bounce back to help more people. Great job. You're doing an amazing job. 
my friends please check out his book you can you can find all the links to to William Steele down in the description of this video now I want to share I noticed later on because again the, the interview part on this channel is a little new so we were we were perfectly live the whole Facebook time but I noticed YouTube I didn't get that on till later at the right time so I will take the the Facebook video and put it on the YouTube that way the whole interview is on YouTube as well and I'll continue to promote it because your word needs to get it needs more reach more eyeballs should learn about William Steele the author who is truly helping people here is what you should know here's how how we can help and how can you help if someone else feels like they're a victim and they want to get their story do you help in that case as well right we're starting a, a straightforward interview program podcast and again we want to interview people please reach out to us um, through my website and any way you can through my Facebook especially William Steele author uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel we're looking for people to interview or dealing with a cold case murder you don't feel you're getting justice we'd love to have the family members of the victims on but we'll also be trying to invite law enforcement on or investigators if they're willing to speak about status of a certain case uh, we realize there's many things they can't divulge and not allowed to divulge but if they can maybe give the uh, public a little more understanding about why things are not resolved um, many of these cases we're helping with are uh, on the internet but uh, please contact us again let us know your story uh, if you have a missing person, missing child, uh, cold case homicide in your family, or if you're wrongfully a uh, family member that's truly innocent and sitting in prison, there's no justice in that. A prosecutor's job is to seek justice, not simply notch convictions. And that's from, I think, from the Supreme Court. You know, they have a difficult job to do to figure out, you know, everybody's in prison, they're innocent. Well, not me. I was guilty. I was guilty as hell. And then I escaped from prison and made it worse. And then I ended up on America's Most Wanted website. So I did what I did, but these are many, many years in my past. But there's so many innocent people I've run across in prison, it's ridiculous. And it's glaring, it's in the paperwork. It's not just in their stories, but they're illiterate, many of them. They don't know how to get help. And the innocent projects around the country can only have the resources and time to help people on death row or life sentences for the most part. So all the minor cases slip through the cracks. But there's so many innocent people in prison. The system needs to be reworked somehow. So one of my books coming out is going to be also about uh, suggestions for criminal justice reform. You know, my observations as a former prisoner and law clerk. Wow. You'll be starting your own 60 days in. <laughs> <laughs> Watch my TV show, August. August. Oh, my gosh, Netflix. yes. And I look forward to having you on again because... As our audience continues to grow, we want to bring on great guests as yourself to keep that word out there. How can we stay safe in our world? And you shared some great information, some of your experiences, some of the big criminals that you have been around and what you're noticing. So thank you so much for joining us today and being a part of this, William. Any last parting words? I just want to remind everybody that's all that's needed for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. So please contact us. We will help you get your story out. Uh, my fiance, Dr. Mary Bass, has a heart of gold. She's a zealous victim advocate, and she's been retaliated on before for her work. And we just look forward to helping people now and trying to rebuild my life post-incarceration by doing the right thing instead of the wrong thing. Great. Thank you so much. And we look forward to having you on again. I'm sure you will be a guest as we continue to have more guests on. And thank you for taking your time out to be here with us. And we hope that every dream you're reaching for, you accomplish. You've overcame a lot. Your story's amazing. Keep doing what you're doing, William, because people need your help. Even those you don't even know yet, they need your help, William. Thank you, Manny. Thank you for the encouragement. I appreciate it. It means a lot. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. Have a great one. My friends, there you have it. He kicked butt. He was really sharing a lot, and you can tell he came 
from his heart. If that's the type of stuff you like to follow, make sure you smash that subscribe button. And if you got some value, make sure you hit that like button because then more people will see it. And truth is, more people need to hear this story. It's an amazing story. My friends, I'm Manny Rodriguez. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you have an amazing day. Peace. Have a great one.